The Rotting Candy Corn Cathedral by Brandon Fairclaw. Life is hard down in the candy corn mines. Blinking, I looked over at Haley. I've been one of her advocates for over a year, working to get her transition back into independent living after a slow slide into schizophrenia at 25 had turned her into a steep droop into an institution for six months. Now, she was just a few weeks away from review at her group home placement, which, depending on how that went, could lead to her being released back fully on her own. If she didn't run into any setbacks, that was. Ailey, what time did you take your meds today? I tried to keep any tension or judgment out of my voice, and I'd carefully phrased my question as though I assumed she had taken them, though I was worried that might not be true. She grinned at me. Eleven o'clock, same as always. We were driving to a nighttime Halloween parade, one of my last times to evaluate her out in the world before I gave my report for the review, and in the passing flickers of streetlight, I tried to read her expression. Was she joking about the candy corn? Lying about her meds? I couldn't tell. Smiling tentatively, I gave her a nod. Cool. So... What is this about candy corn mind? Looking back out at the road, she gave a small shrug. Doesn't matter. You won't believe me. I forced a laugh I didn't feel. <laughs> hey, no fair. I'm curious now. What is it? She let out a small sigh. It's just... No, this is real. Not for me. Look, I know what you mean. Like, you're nervous about getting back out on your own, right? That's totally n Snorting, she shook her head. <laughs> no. I'm worried about the shrimp priests and the things that live under the cathedral. Heart starting to pound quicker, I slowed until I spotted a good place to pull over and park. When she shot me a questioning glance, I nodded. It's okay, we're still going to be in time for the parade, I just... I wanted to be able to understand what you're talking about, and it's harder for me to give you my full attention when I'm driving. Putting the car in park, I glanced around outside. I wasn't that familiar with this part of the city, and while it did look old and run down, it didn't look particularly unsafe. Just a few people driving by or on the sidewalks, and there were no unsavory characters lurking in the two alleyways I could see. Turning back to her, I tried to look excited. So, tell me about all this. You say shrimp priests? Haley nodded. I mean, yeah, that's what I call them. Not because they're short, they're taller than me or you, but they have so many little legs and hands and their backs. You can see their backs and spots through their robes that they wear because their robes are like old and kind of rotten, I guess. And their backs are all hard and segmented like a lobster or a shrimp felt a chill pass over my back and trying to ignore it. Okay. So, is this something you saw on TV or made up or... No. I can dream them sometimes. No, that's not right. I can see them sometimes when I dream. Okay. Now, you just distinguish between dreaming them and seeing them when you dream... What does that distinction mean to you? She looked at me for a moment, her expression almost sad. You really do try to help me. I know that. A lot of them, they don't really see you. You're just a problem to them. Whether they're trying to solve you or just get past you so they can get home, but... You really do listen, don't you? I nodded. I try, Haley, and I do care. I'm just I'm confused by what you're talking about and not understanding. Well, it has me a little worried. So I just want to get what you're saying better. Does that make sense? Instead of answering me directly, she turned and looked out the window as she began to speak. I make that distinction because I'm not dreaming them up. It's just sometimes when I dream, I remember the truth. And when I do, I can see that place. 
the real place I am. Okay. Um, tell me about that place, please, Haley. When she turned back to me, there were tears in her eyes. Okay. If you want me to. This guy is always angry there. During the day, it turns green or orange like an endless blank of clouds, reading for a storm that is always there and yet never comes. At night, everything is still and clear and black, with every star standing out with a yellow glow so sharp it'll cut you if you stare too long. It wasn't until my second time remembering that I noticed the constellations were different than here. Not until my third time that I realized I recognized them just like I do the ones here. One of the things that works us in the mines taught them to me when we were carrying our full wagon up the hill to the cathedral. The road up to the cathedral is packed black dirt. Most things on either side of that path are either green clay or strange trees that twist up from it and then sag back down as though they're exhausted from trying to escape that place. Not all of the land is like that. In the distance, I can see a city of black stone, and beyond that, a shadowed sea. The road we take is very dangerous. There are things there. They look like giant snakes when they're closed up and moving, but they like to get into the trees and stay very still unless you pass close by. They look like branches, mostly, until they move. And when they do... They open themselves, somehow. They glide down, and far away it looks like a huge bat is coming for you, but when they get closer, you see that at the bottom of them, the open gliding part, it's all just wet meat and teeth. Rows and rows of hooked teeth. When they land on someone, they wrap around them in a second. They hit them so hard, I've seen a big man get knocked on his feet, and by the time he tried to scream, his face was already covered in teeth, and they were tightening around him as they started to roll away across the sick green earth. They keep holes burrowed in all over, so you never catch them, even if you were dumb enough to try. Light scares them. At least a little. Whenever we carry a load to the cathedral, we have two people sitting on the front and back of each wagon with a big jack-o'-lantern in their lap. They get an hour off the day before to carve the pumpkin, and the candle inside is rendered by the mine's reclaimers. Hair and fat from the dead, you know. So much of what they do is strange to me, but they don't let anything go to waste. The jack-o'-lanterns keep some of the snake things back, and it works on the lantern eyes, too. Oh, yeah. The eyes are... Well, they look like a cat's, except for their necks are long and crooked, and their eyes are way too big. So big and glowing. It's all you see when they wake up and look at you from off the road somewhere. Crushed salt is always scattered on the road because the lantern eyes don't like it. I think it burns them some. So between that and the light, they tend to stay back, just watching with their terrible eyes, waiting to see if someone gets too close to the edge of the road or their pumpkin goes out. I've never seen it happen, but sometimes the eyes take someone even if they're on the road. We always know it was them because when they're done eating the parts they like, they impale what's left on one of the trees near the road. Maybe to tell us that our travels aren't as safe as we'd like to think. I've been talking about the road and the trips to the cathedral, and I do need to tell you about the cathedral itself, but I guess I should mention the mines, since that's where we are most of the time. Vast mines that go miles underground gray and green patches of earth and rock that can make you sick or crazy if you touch them for too long, all shot through with clusters of, well, candy corn. I know that sounds silly, but there are giant pieces of candy corn buried in the walls and floor of that place, and every day it's our job to carefully dig them out so they can go up to the shrimp priest in the cathedral. 
think at one time they were doing all this to rebuild the church. It's made of candy corn, you know, though you can't tell except up close. The cathedral's rotting, always rotting, and all of the millions and millions of candy corn that make up its walls and doors and statues and symbols, they're all speckled white and gray as little red worms crawl in and out. It makes sense they'd want to replace some of that, right? It's so gross, and it smells so bad. But no. I figured out that they always carry the fresh candy down beneath the church to what lives down there. The things they all worship and serve. And even though it's all rotting, it never goes away. I've heard that the things under the church think that place alive. And for us that are stuck there, they dream us back here when they're asleep. To a life in this world for a little while. Part of us is always there, but their dreaming gives us times where our minds and souls can rest a little, if only for a time. I waited until she fell silent to speak. Haley, that's a really interesting story, but you do know it's just a story, don't you? Her gaze narrowed. No, it's not. I'm telling the truth. I puffed out a long breath. Okay. So you think that everyone in this world is actually trapped in some hell and that this is just a temporary dream, something gives us to keep us sane? She shook her head slightly, that melancholy look passing back over her face. No, not everybody. Not most people, but some of us? Yeah. Do you know how... Look, think about what you're describing. Mining candy corn, things that look like bats and cats, jack-o'-lanterns. It's some kind of macabre Halloween art project. How does it make sense? Do they celebrate Halloween there? Haley looked out the window again, this time at the alley on her side of the car. I don't know. I don't think they celebrate it. I think they are it, or at least an aspect of it. Or Halloween isn't part of reflection of what they do in that place. It just gets jumbled up and wrong and softened here, like things often do in dreams. Because this reality is just a dream. Another long sigh. <sighs> You're not listening. The world is the world, at least I think it is. But they insert us into the world. Maybe we're from here originally and they took us a long time ago, I don't know. But they dream a part of us back into the world from time to time. We get to live our lives and worry about dumb shit and get locked up for threatening a security guard at the mall. Maybe that part's just me. And then eventually, we start dreaming about that other place again. It happens when whichever one was dreaming us here starts waking up. Time is different there, and it takes a while, but eventually this place starts to fade away for us, because we were never really here. For the rest of the world, maybe we go missing, or they forget we ever existed until we pop in again down the line. I don't have all the answers, I just know what's real, and... Oh no. Her body had gone rigid as she gripped the door handle on her side hard enough to make it creak. What is it? My chest was tight with fear, and while much of it was concerned for her and what I should do next, I wasn't sure that was the only thing I heard in my voice now. What are you looking at? It's here. Oh God, it's here. I see its eyes in the alley, green and glowing. They've sent for me. I... No. I'm just seeing it there. Everything here is fading away. What do you see? My words were shrill and loud, desperate, as I reached out to grab her arm and found I couldn't. I could still see her and hear her, but somehow she was beyond my grasp. Oh no. I see it all. The cathedral up the hill. It hurts my eyes, but I can't look away. Everything is rotting and burning, and it never, ever ends. 
I could see the alley beyond the car now because I could see through Haley, if only a little. And it may have been my imagination, but there was a green glow coming from that outer dark. I screamed her name, tried to grab her again, but it was no good. Head throbbing, I called out the question burning in my chest now that my doubts had been eaten by my fear and anger. Anger that by telling me all this, she had somehow infected me with it or caused it to notice me. Why? Why did you tell me about this terrible place? She faded away in the next instant, but her words lingered in the air a moment longer, long enough for me to hear her reply and start crying harder as I put the car into drive and drove off into the night. Because you're here too. No candles, no exceptions by Rana Vassilar. My mom was a little bit peculiar about Halloween. She wasn't a superstitious person by nature and no other holidays perturbed her. We celebrated Christmas and Easter and Thanksgiving without a problem. She took no issue with black cats or broken mirrors or spilled salt. She followed no religion, observed no rituals. It was really just Halloween that was the problem. She wasn't cruel about it or unfair. She let us celebrate when we were kids, let us pick our own costumes, took us out trick-or-treating, let us keep our candy, although we had to give up a few Reese cups each. She called them mom tax. But every year, a few days before Halloween, she sat us down on the living room couch and she asked, What's our rule for Halloween? And Ellen, my younger sister, and I would reply in tandem, don't ever light a candle on Halloween night. But mom, I asked once, what about my jack-o'-lantern? We'll put a flashlight inside, she said firmly. No candles. But mom, said Ellen, just to be contrary, what if the power goes out and we don't have any flashlights? Can't we light a candle then? My mom glared at her in a way that said, don't push your luck, young lady. No Candles. No exceptions. So that's how things went on Halloween. As I grew older, I learned to stop questioning her. She was, after all, an excellent mother. She just had this one unexplainable quirk. I figured, hey, I could live with that. And live with it, I did. Even after I moved out and graduated college, got a place of my own, my jack-o'-lanterns were always unlit, if I bothered to carve them at all. My friends would laugh when I would tell them our one Halloween rule growing up, but nobody ever gave me real grief about it. To be honest, I didn't really think about the candle again until after my mom had died and Ellen and I were fully established adults, living on our own and only seeing each other a few times a year. A few days after Halloween, I got a call from the Edmonton Police Department asking if I had seen Ellen. No, I haven't seen her in months. We spoke on the phone about a week ago. Is something wrong? She's been reported missing by a friend. Apparently she stopped showing up to work and nobody's been able to get a hold of her. We're just making the rounds to see if she's gone on a trip and forgot to mention it to anybody. I knew immediately something was terribly wrong. Ellen isn't the type of person to forget things like that. Of uh, the two of us, she's always the most responsible and level-headed. As soon as I hung up the phone, I took off work and bought a plane ticket. Within 24 hours, I was standing outside her little two-story house, hoping against all hope that she'd be safe there. Alive. I found the fake hollow rock that held the spare key and let myself inside. Ellen, You here? You've got us all worried sick about you. I called out, ignoring the growing panic in my gut. Everything's okay. Ellen's fine. Nothing's happened. I repeated that over and over in my head, but I didn't believe it myself. I searched the house from top to bottom. All of Ellen's things were there. Wallet, keys, suitcase, luggage. She clearly hadn't intended to leave. If leaving's what she'd done. So what could have possibly happened? I felt sick to my stomach. 
I decided I'd drive down to the police station and talk to the officer in person. As I was walking out of the house, I noticed something I'd overlooked before. There was a jack-o'-lantern sitting on the porch, carved into a bat. I'm not sure why, but I felt compelled to take a closer look at it. Inside, the bottom of the pumpkin was full of candle wax, but there was no candle to be found. Months went by with no sign of Ellen. The police investigated, suspecting foul play may have been involved since she'd disappeared with none of her belongings. Eventually, however, they told me they were calling off the search. There's no evidence of foul play. She had no known enemies. There's no sign of forced entry at the house, said the officer, somewhat apologetic. We have to consider the possibility that, for whatever reason, she took it on herself to vanish, start a new life. Sometimes people do these things, people you'd never expect. I didn't take that news very well. I cursed, I screamed, I took the story to the news, but everyone just shrugged their shoulders, shook their head, and moved on with their lives. But me? I kept thinking about that candle. It was stupid. Ridiculous. Just my mother's nonsense superstition, but desperate people will latch onto the most improbable things just to find answers. And I was certainly desperate. That's why, nearly one year later, I was letting myself into my sister's house once again. It was dusty, but I'd been paying the electricity and water bills to keep the place up and running for when she came back. Because I couldn't accept the possibility that she wasn't coming back. It was Halloween night, and I'd brought with me a long white candle and a pumpkin. It was stupid. A dumb theory that I was only clinging to because I had nothing left. That knowledge didn't stop me. I sat down, carved my pumpkin into a bat, just like hers. I put it on the porch where her pumpkin had sat last year and placed the candle inside. As soon as dusk hit, I lit the candle and then retreated into the house. I tried to imagine what she was doing that night after lighting the candle. Probably getting ready for trick-or-treaters. I wouldn't have any of those tonight as I'd left the porch lights off. So I sat there in my sister's living room, going through old photo albums and crying. It had to work. It wouldn't work. My mind tossed and turned, reflecting the turmoil in my soul. I was certain it would keep me awake all night. Nobody was more surprised than myself when I drifted off to sleep, sitting there on the living room couch, remembering my mother and wondering what she'd think of her daughters now. I woke up to a searing pain on my cheek. Fuck! I shouted, my hand coming up to my face. I blinked wildly, clearing the bleariness from my eyes. The room was dark. That's funny, I don't remember turning out the lights. Except for one burning candle. The candle that I'd left in the jack-o'-lantern outside. The candle was now floating in front of my face. The burning sensation was from a hot drip of wax splattering onto my cheek. I stared at the floating candle in disbelief. Am I dreaming? I wondered. The candle started to float away to the back door. Hey, wait! I called and then properly felt like an idiot for talking to a goddamn candle. The candle was waiting, for lack of a better term, at the back door for me. I reached out to open it and allow the candle and myself passage. To my surprise, the door didn't open out into the night air like it was supposed to. Instead, there was a long, stone passageway where my sister's backyard should have been. I followed behind the candle, straining to see in the dim light. The floor was covered in wax droppings, as though the candle, or its siblings, had made this trip often in the past. It felt strange on my bare feet. The topmost layer was still fresh. It was no longer hot, but warm and soft enough that it felt like walking on something living. There were things on the walls, too. 
furrows and scratches in stone, ugly stains where it looked like someone had tried to write or draw. Couldn't make anything out though, not with only the candle to light my way. I ignored the sick, squirmy feeling the faded symbols and scratches gave me as I walked on. It felt as though we walked an age before I saw the light up ahead. I ran ahead of my own candle to meet it, running out the end of the passageway and into what appeared to be a large room. Above my head there were thousands of candles lighting the room, dripping wax like rain onto the floor. My candle floated up to join them as I stared in disbelief. I hissed as the wax fell on my skin. I tried to stumble back toward the passage to take shelter from the wax, but when I turned around, the door had been shut and locked. I was trapped. It's a terrible, ugly feeling being caught in a trap that you don't understand. I was afraid of what I would find if I walked around the room getting a closer look at my surroundings, but I pushed it down ruthlessly. This is for Ellen, I thought. She's here. I know she's here. I have to find her. Turning back around, I ventured further into the room. The floor was covered in wax, several feet deep if I had to guess. And it was burning. The wax on top was fresh, and my feet sunk into its blistering heat. I cried out as I stepped forward, feeling the hot wax coating my feet to my ankle bone. The pain was making me nauseous. So was the smell. The room was permeating with an awful stink. It seemed out of place. It didn't smell like candle wax. It had to be coming from somewhere else, but where? The falling wax obscured my vision. I could do little but walk forward and hope for the best. By the time I found something, my skin was blistering and peeling, my hair was coated in wax, and my feet were in such horrible pain I could barely force myself forward. I was brought up short by towers of wax. They almost looked like bars of a cage, but for the fact that they weren't made of metal. At least not at first glance. Curious, I grabbed the wax bar, ignoring the pain, and started to pull it apart. My intuition was right. Underneath, I found the metal bars, a cage indeed. But I was at the top of it, the bars at my height, then covered with a roof of metal bars as well. I couldn't see the bottom of the bars. It was obscured by the wax that had built up over time. I couldn't see anything in the cage, nor could I discern a purpose for it. I shrugged and kept walking. Something was fluttering restlessly in the back of my mind. I was on the verge of understanding what was happening here. But there was something missing. I pushed on in hopes of finding it. I came to another cage, this one taller. I guess that the cages were the same size, and this one was sitting higher from the ground for some reason. Perhaps it had been placed here later than the other cage. It, too, was covered in wax. Just like the other, it didn't seem to hold anything. I continued on. I passed a few more cages of varying heights before I found an aberration. This cage was much, much taller than the others. I couldn't reach its top from where I was standing, and like the others, there was a large lump of wax resting against one side of the cage. I got as close as I could, put my hands through the bars, and started to pull off wax clumps. As I did, the horrible smell that saturated the air became even worse. I put one arm in front of my nose and mouth as I continued to dismantle the lump one-handed. Eventually, I pulled away something wet. Underneath, I saw black, sticky blood covering a thick white bone. I dropped my clump of wax and shoved it back from the wax-covered body. Finally, I understood the purpose of the cages. 
I grabbed my mouth, forcing a scream back as I stumbled through the room. Finding more cages with bodies in varying states of death and decomposition. A few of them were sprawled out onto the floors of their cages, their arms reaching through the bars, begging for mercy. Some were covered in so thin a film of wax I could still see their open eyes, distorted and distended from the heat of the wax. I tried to force myself not to vomit. When I finally stumbled onto her cage, my heart leapt into my throat and stubbornly refused to budge. She wasn't dead. She was crawling through the wax, refusing to stop. Her body burnt, almost beyond recognition. As she crawled, she clawed the wax off herself at intervals. I could hear her breath heaving in and out of her. I shouldn't have been able to recognize her through the damage done to her skin, but somehow I knew. She wasn't dead. But this looked worse. I lurched over the cage and fell to my knees. Ellen? Ellen, is that you? It's me, Abigail. She looked up at me, her eyes still unmirrored by the falling wax, and she let out a horrible, keening noise. I knew I'd be hearing that awful sound in my nightmares for the rest of my life. I'm going to get you out of here. Don't worry. Everything is okay. I'll figure it out, I promise. I lifted my iron poker and swung it at the bars as hard as I could, over and over and over. But I wasn't strong enough. Or maybe the bars themselves were too strong. The lock. I looked down at Ellen, shocked that it was her who had spoken. Her voice was brittle and cracked like nothing I'd ever heard from her before. There's a padlock on the other side of the cage. There's a door. I got to my feet and hurried to the other side. Desperate, I began pulling at the wax until I found the large lump covering chains and lock. I cleaned it off as best I could, then I swung the poker at it. It took a few swings, but eventually the lock gave way. I fell to my knees once again and shoveled through the wax blocking the door from opening. Once I felt I'd cleared enough away, I began to pull on the door. It was impossible. I felt it in my guts as I strained. The hinges were full of wax. There was still so much wax blocking it from opening. There was no way I could get it to even budge. Hurry, Abby. Please, it's coming. What's coming? I asked. And I heard it. A clanging noise, like chains being dragged behind a jailer. A surge of adrenaline went straight to my heart. All my strength went to my arms, and I stood there, and I pulled. It moved. By God, it moved just enough that Ellen was able to squeeze through the opening, aided along by the slippery wax still covering her body. She collapsed onto me, and I almost screamed at the heat of her wax-covered body. How on earth was she still alive? Would she still be alive when I got her out of this awful place? We have to go, now, she shrieked. And we went. Stumbling past the cages, back the way we came, I could only hope we were going in the right direction once we passed the final cage. We were walking blind, still surrounded on all sides by falling wax. The wax had begun to cover my skin, trapping the heat until it felt like I was roasting from the inside out. Finally... We stumbled into a wall, a wall without a door. It has to be here, I muttered, feeling along the wall. The rattling was getting louder. Whatever that thing was, it was getting closer. I placed my right hand along the wall, holding Ellen close to me with my left arm. We'll keep walking until we find it, I told her, staggering forward, feeling blindly for the exit. There's no time, she moaned. It's here. It's found us, and now we'll never escape. Before I could respond, the smooth stone gave way to wood. It's here, I shouted. I yanked at the door. Locked. I'd forgotten the door was locked. Ellen whispered, It's too late. Oh, God. 
very, very slowly, I turned around. The thing was seven feet tall, at least, hunched over it and draped in a red robe. Its arms were bony, blackened, like it had been charred. I couldn't tell if it were really made of bone or if it was covered in leathery skin. It was hard to tell through the chains and padlocks that had wrapped around one wrist. It stepped closer. Curiously, the wax didn't seem to touch it as it rained down before it hit the thing's figure. It vanished. That meant it was easier to see. I wish it hadn't been. It looked like a bloody candle standing there among the wax. I could feel it staring at me and was desperately glad that I couldn't yet see its face. I was sure that if I caught sight of it, I would go mad. It lifted its claw-like hand and pointed at me. No, I said as it stepped closer to us. With trembling arms, I gripped my poker in both hands and held it in front of me. You won't take us now without a fight and then something curious happened the beast or wraith whatever it was reared back stumbling in the wax as it held up a hand as though warding me off what the hell I said taking an experimental step forward and brandishing my weapon the thing stepped back again emitting a grinding shriek that put nails on a chalkboard to shame what is that? asked Ellen. It's just the iron poker from the fireplace, I said. A surge of hope filled me as I stepped back toward the door. I waved the poker over it and heard a clicking noise. Without any prompting, the door swung open into the passageway. Run! I screamed, grabbing Ellen and pulling her after me. I held the poker high to warn off anything that might follow. The beast didn't give chase. Instead, it let out a bellow, shaking the stone walls and nearly throwing us off our feet. It caused a sharp, throbbing pain in my head, and I thought for one insane moment that it had ruptured my eardrum. I saw the second door ahead of us. This one wasn't locked, and we threw it open and stumbled out into Ellen's living room, collapsing onto the floor. I looked at Ellen. She looked back at me. And then, without further prompting, both of us passed out. When we woke up in the morning, it was as though nothing had ever happened. Ellen wasn't burnt, covered in wax. She looked the same as I imagined she looked the night she disappeared. She was wearing pajamas and looked no worse for wear. My eardrums were fine, so was my skin. That horrible burning, peeling, and blistering had disappeared sometime during the night. How is this possible? I asked. She shook her head in disbelief. For one terrible, awful moment, I thought she wasn't real. That this was all some hideous nightmare, and I'd wake up sisterless once more. But as we walked down to the morning sunlight and stumbled into my car, it gradually dawned on me that I'd done it. I'd found her. We piled into the car and headed to the hospital because we simply didn't know what else to do. And on the way, she began to laugh. Eventually, I joined in, and we laughed ourselves all the way to the ER door. Things were difficult for a while, though not quite so difficult as I'd anticipated. She told the doctors that she'd hit her head and forgotten everything. She'd only just remembered a few days ago and made her way back home to find me sitting on the living room sofa. I brought her into the hospital to make sure she was okay. The police showed up, of course. They didn't seem to believe her version of events, but they eventually accepted it. After all, she reappeared alive and unharmed. There was no evidence of criminal activity or wrongdoing. There was no reason to investigate any further. After that, I took Ellen home. As we walked inside the house, I saw that the candle had disappeared from inside my pumpkin. And now I knew where it had gone. We didn't talk very much about what happened in that horrible place. 
She understandably didn't want to relive it once she had escaped, but there was one thing I had to ask her. As we sat at the kitchen table that morning, I said, How did you live an entire year in there? All the others I saw were dead. How are you still alive? Dead? She said, staring at me. No, you don't understand. Nobody in there is dead. Some people simply gave up. The wax builds up, melts off their skin, reduces them to bone and viscera for eternity. But none of them can die. Death doesn't exist in that place. I guess, for that matter, life doesn't either. Not the kind of life we understand anyway. I knew if I stopped crawling, if I gave up, I'd just be trapped in the wax like the others. I couldn't do that. Anything was better than that. That was years ago now. To this day, I don't understand what happened in that awful place. I don't know how lighting a candle opens the door on Halloween night or why it doesn't open the door for everyone. I don't know why nobody who enters there dies or why we left that place miraculously unharmed. I don't know how that poker was able to ward off the disgusting creature that would have sentenced me to the same fate as Ellen. All I do know is that as soon as I got back home, I threw out every single candle in the house. Halloween or not, I'll never light another candle again. Hey everyone. I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. I know a lot of you said that you wanted more psychological horror, so that first one is probably right up your alley. And I think even the second one plays into it a little bit. Um, I liked them both. I thought they were both really, really good. I do have a question for everyone tonight. Um, based around the second story, that's what my question is, based around the second story, what are some superstitions that you or your family believe in, whether it be specifically about Halloween or any other holiday or just in general, I'd be really interested to hear some of the urban legends or some of the uh, myths and things that you all believe in. And we got a pretty diverse audience out there, so I'm interested to see uh, myths and legends from other cultures and other places from around the world. I think it'd be really interesting. Personally, I've never heard of anything about not lighting a candle on Halloween. I'm not sure if the person who wrote it just made that up or if it's based somewhere in reality. So if you have something like that, let me know. Or if you have something that doesn't fit that exactly or just something that you think is interesting about your culture, let me know. I'd love to read about it. I want to give a quick thanks to everyone on screen right now. Those are our $5 patrons and members. I keep the channel running here lately, and I really, really appreciate you all your support, support from all of you. My words are a little jumbled right now. I've been having a rough week. Um, but anyway, thank you to everyone who watches, listens, leaves likes, leaves comments. It's all greatly appreciated, and it all helps. It really does. Uh, if you would like to support on Patreon or over here on YouTube, you can become a member or a patron. Either way, whichever one works better for you. Links are down in the description, but I'm going to leave it here. Thanks again, everyone, for the support. Be sure to leave your urban legends down in the comment section below. And as always, take care out there.